place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. And by the way, Mary also descended from David. They both descended from the line of David. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. That's reading from the NIV. Wrapped in swaddling clothes or cloths. Some have thought uh, that there was a theory that swaddling clothes were burial cloths, such as Jesus had wrapped on him when he was buried in such as... Um, when, such as Lot had when, he, when, when Jesus called him out of the grave. But a study of the Greek shows that is not so. Some have said that there were rags. Uh, when we were in school, that's what the sisters taught us. We went to the, to the Catholic school, my wife and I, and that's what uh, at least one of them said. Those were probably rags, just old cloths that were good for nothing because that was the sign of the humility of Jesus' birth, but um, not so. The Greek word this comes from is sparganu, S-P-A-R-G-A-N-O-O. -O. Luke 2.12 says, this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. The sign identifying the baby as the Messiah was that he would be wrapped in baby cloths or clothes, in other words, in sporganu. sporganu. Historical records reveal that what was significant about these cloths. It was common in ancient times to put, not to put, what we would call diapers on the babies. They were allowed to run around with nothing on. Most likely, only the wealthy had enough to uh, afford such clothing or clothing for their children. Otherwise, they ran around naked. I don't think in the wintertime, though. But since many people had to leave home and travel to their town of, this, of their ancestors, some think it was likely that some wealthy family gave Mary some clothes for the baby when it would be born. What's really significant is that Jesus was also in a manger and thought to be an animal trough. So Jesus laying in an animal trough and wrapped in what would be the cloths of wealthier people would be an incredible sign to the shepherds. Maybe Mary brought the swaddling clothes, the sparganu, with her. We don't really know. Another theory comes from the research of Cooper Abrams and an excerpt from his research is this. This is very interesting. Clearly the city of Jesus' birth was Bethlehem, as Micah 5, 2 prophesied, and as the Gospels of Matthew, Luke, and John confirm. Luke proclaims the birthplace as Bethlehem. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, a city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. So 1 Samuel confirms Bethlehem as the city of David, where it says, But David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. That was obviously his hometown. But where in Bethlehem was Jesus born? The fact is that uh, the New Testament doesn't mention the exact place, you know, the address in Bethlehem of where Jesus was born. Nowhere does the Bible record that he was born in a stable attended by donkeys, chickens, and cows. 
as the nativity scenes uh, present. In the past, it was speculated that because there was no room for them in the inn, and that he was born in a stable behind the inn where the animals were kept. We were taught that when we were in school. But that's a conjecture. It's not scriptural. And um, the New Testament specifically says that he was laid in a manger in Bethlehem. So people think, well, it's a manger, so therefore it's a, that's a feeding place for animals. Therefore, he was in a stable. But maybe not. It doesn't say he was in a stable. The only reason for us to think that he was in a stable was the word manger. We think that where there was a manger, there would be animals, and that there were animals, that's a stable. Maybe not. This is interesting. Abrams continues. Nowhere in the Bible, nowhere does the Bible record that Jesus was born in a stable attended by donkeys, chickens, and cows, as many nativity scenes present. In the past, it was speculated that because there was room, uh, no room for Joseph and Mary in the inn, that he was born in the stable behind the inn where the animals were kept. It's a conjecture, and it's false. And um, we shouldn't really apply speculation like that to the word. All it specifically says that he was laid in a manger in Bethlehem. So the popular word con uh, conception is the word manger refers to a trough where the animals were fed. It, that may be inaccurate. However, it could mean simply a stall. The Greek word which is translated in our English Bibles as manger is, this is a hard one to pronounce, yadin fatne. Yadin fatne. Uh, the definition of that word is of a stall where animals are kept. It doesn't translate as manger, but as a separate enclosure, a stall, or a crib, in other words. So the question is, what kind of stall or manger is the New Testament referring to, and what kind of animal was fed or housed there, because that word indicates an enclosure where the animal would be housed, maybe fed there. So although the New Testament doesn't tell us where in Bethlehem Jesus was born, the Old Testament does. Micah 4.8 states, And thou, O tower of the flock, a stronghold of the daughter of Zion, unto thee it shall come, even the first dominion, the kingdom shall come to the daughter of Jerusalem. Thus, the Old Testament clearly states that the Messiah would be born at the Tower of the Flock. Let me read that verse again. And thou, O Tower of the Flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, unto thee shall it come. So it must be noted that Ephrath, or Ephratha, was the ancient name for that area, which was later called Bethlehem. According to Genesis 35, 19, after Jacob buried Rachel, he moved his flocks beyond the tower of Adar, or Migdal Adar. The location of Rachel's tomb today is outside of the outskirts of present-day Bethlehem, but it clearly was not when Jacob buried his wife there. Clearly the area which is called Bethlehem in biblical times covered an area greater than does present-day Bethlehem. It was a larger city, and that tower of the flock was inside of Bethlehem. First, we know that Megdal Adar was the watchtower that guarded the temple flocks. This is getting more interesting. The temple flocks that were being raised to serve as sacrificial animals in the temple. They were not just any flock and herd. The shepherds who kept them were men who were specially trained for the royal task, they were educated in what an animal 
that was to be sacrificed had to be, and it was their job to make sure that none of these animals were hurt, damaged, or blemished. They had to be perfect for sacrifices. And they kept them in this tower, the tower of the flock. So these lambs apparently were wrapped in swaddling cloths to protect them from injury and also were used to wrap the Lord Jesus. Fascinating that he was born in the strong tower, which was the tower of the flock where the sacrificial lambs were kept. Fascinating. And he was the sacrificial lamb himself. In this setting, Micah 4, it uses the prophecy of the Babylonian captivity of the southern kingdom as a pledge to guarantee of the birth of Christ at Migdal Adar at Bethlehem, which is exactly where it took place. Micah prophesied that as surely as Assyrians would soon carry away Israel in the north, so the Messiah would come and establish his kingdom. The first dominion, the kingdom shall come to Jerusalem. The verse states that as surely as Babylonian captivity would carry away the tribe of Judah in the south also, or into captivity, so the Messiah would arrive at the tower of the flock. This prophecy was the other evidence that later proved that Jesus was the Messiah, but one that Israel ignored in rejecting him as the Messiah, that he was born in the tower of the flock. We know that Jesus was born in Migdal Adar, the strong tower, which was inside of Bethlehem. We know that he was born there, we know there was no room for them in the inn. We don't know how many inns might have been in Bethlehem, but they couldn't find, no one could accommodate them because all these people were traveling there to register for the census. They needed a safe place to birth the child. Micah prophesied that the Messiah would be born in the watchtower. Migdal Adar, which was at Bethlehem. And, and it, that it was at Bethlehem was also prophesied. There were shepherds nearby. It was their tower, used for the birthing place of sacrificial lambs. Jesus, the ultimate sacrifice, was born in the strong tower. Isn't that an amazing fact? Isn't that an awesome thing? Jesus is the strong tower. He is the strong tower to all who would have him. Mary and Joseph needed a safe place to bring an infant into the world. The infant grew up to be the perfect sacrificial lamb, the only sacrifice that could pay the penalty for my sins and your sins and the sins of mankind. Now he is the strong tower. We can run to him and be safe. Proverbs 18.10, the name of the Lord is a fortified tower, a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. Where do we run? We run to Jesus. Jesus is the strong tower. He was born in a, in a strong tower and he is the strong tower. The only problem is that many still have no room for him. So many have no room in their hearts, no room in their lives, no room for his grace, no room for his authority, no room for his love. The tragedy of life is that most people refuse him. They trample the perfect gift of God underfoot. But what about us believers? Our actions should demonstrate to the world around us that our love for him comes first over anything else that we experience. So are we too busy for him? Should Jesus come first in our lives? Yes. Are we too busy? Maybe. Maybe. 
Life is full of stuff, full of distractions, problems at work, problems at home, problems raising children, problems with teenagers. Got to take care of this. Got to take care of that. Got to go here, got to go there. Got to eat some of this, got to get some of this, got to get some of that. Busy, busy, busy. Especially this time of year we are. Proverbs 3, 6 says in all, it says in all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. But that's something we have to practice, isn't it? We have to practice it. Give it all to God. Do you, do you close him out? Is there room for him in all of your waking hours? 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. At first glance, this might seem impossible, but God wouldn't advise it if it weren't possible. So is there room for him in our thoughts? Do we carry our love for him in our constant thinking? That's, a, that's something we should, it should be a goal at least. We do carry our loved ones in our thinking. So why not God? Why not Jesus? Is there room for him in our prayer life? Do we even have a prayer life? Do, do we only pray when we need something? Do we only pray when we're in trouble? Does our prayer time consist of only requests? <laughs> prayer is our communication with our Lord and Savior. He might have something to say. <laughs> Instead of just listening to what we got to say. So prayer should be a two-way communication. We should just quiet our spirit down and see if God puts a thought, puts an impression into our spirit. Is there room for Him in our worship? Are we only singing songs? Where do the songs come from? Do we worship when we tithe? When we give God 10% of our income as a tithe when he's, and, and, and our offerings? That's a worshipful thing to do. And some people say, well, that's Leviticus. Well, no, it's not. It predates Leviticus because Abraham gave a tenth of all that he gained in a war with the, with the kings um, in the time of Sodom. And he gave a tenth to Melchizedek, who brought out bread and wine. And some think, and I agree, that Melchizedek was a pre-incarnate Christ, that he was Jesus. He's praised in the New Testament. Think how awesome he was. Talking about Melchizedek, I think that was the Lord. And bread and wine is, represents Jesus. So is there room for him in that, in the worship? Where do the songs come from? Do they come from gratitude or do they come from the screen? Something to think about. Are we demonstrative? How do we show God how much we love Him? You know, do we raise our hands and I mean, is it is it demonstrative or we just keep all that to ourselves? How do we show God how much we love Him? If you come come into somebody's presence that you love and you sit down on the other side of the room and say, I love you, but you stay away from them. Is that, is that what you do? Probably not. <laughs> I remember having to do that when I had mononucleosis. And I kept checking with the doctor uh, every week. I said, I have a girlfriend and I want to kiss her. And she had to come over to my house and sit on the other side of the room. <laughs> and, I, and I kept, I kept calling up asking, okay, how about now? You know, and finally I got the okay. <laughs> Worked out because I still got her. Man, that was a long time ago. More than 50 years ago. Psalm 98, 4 to 6 says, Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Burst in a jubilant song with music. Do we do that? 
Is our praise, our song, is it jubilant? Make music, verse 5, to the Lord with the harp. With the harp and the sound of singing, with trumpets and the blast of a ram, ram's horn, shout for joy before the Lord, the King. So, do we have something to be joyful about? Or is what's f foremost in our thoughts, the things, the aches and pains and problems and trials, is that what's foremost? Or do we have something to be joyful about? Do we anticipate eternity with God? Do we know Him as our Lord and Savior? That's a joyful thing that we celebrate for. And Luke 19, 40 said, I tell you, if they keep quiet, if, if they keep quiet, in other words, the people keep quiet and don't worship Him, the stones will cry out. You want a stone to do your worshiping for you? <laughs> you want a stone to do your worshiping? <laughs> Down, down in our home church, somebody brought a big rock in there and they painted on there. It says, or I will. <laughs> God needs to be worshipped. He deserves it. He's worthy of our worship and our praise. That should come out of our hearts of gratitude. <laughs> God is so good. So good. There's no way we can... Praise Him enough. There's no way we can demonstrate enough. There's no way that we can powerfully enough thank Him for all His goodness. He is so good. He is so awesome. You know, if you were able to get out of bed this morning, thank God for that. <laughs> if you had something to eat for breakfast, thank God for that. Some people don't. And if you're breathing, thank God for that. Some people can't do that. They have to have a thing on their nose. We don't have that. God is so good. God is so good. Everybody has aches and pains, except these young people over there. And Richie and Tina. They're young. They're in their 50s, but they're just youngsters. <laughs> the rest of us all have an ache or a pain here and there. So what? Praise God anyway. Amen? Amen? Amen. He's so good. So awesomely good. He came from glory. Came from heaven. Allowed himself to be made lower than the angels. To dwell among sinful men and sinful earth. To be rejected and despised. To be tormented, tortured, abused, and killed on a cross of Calvary laid in a grave behind a stone but he showed that he was who he said he was came out of that grave <laughs> walked around made himself known to people for what does it say 40 days 40 days proved who he said he had who he said he was and lifted up into the clouds right in the presence of a crowd of people and he's coming back. Hallelujah. He's coming back. Glory to God. We have a lot of things to, to praise him about. So many things to worship him for. It's just truly amazing. Do you know how great is our God back there? Let's all stand and sing this song. We're going to worship God singing how great is our God. Let's do that. If Richie has it. I don't know all the words. So. Do you have it? Sing it. Is that what you're trying to do? Yeah. 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 I don't have to use any of the words. Just the words. Okay, you got another song? No. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. And all will see how great. How great is our God. One more time. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. Dear Lord, it's been 
your house today. It's been good to be with the believers in the house today. And as we have this time of fellowship that we're anticipating, we pray that you'll bless the food and the health of our bodies. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.